Praise the Lord. Turn to Revelation 13 tonight. We're going to pick up just a couple of verses, and they are a couple of those that are speculated upon speculation, upon speculation, upon speculatory thoughts, upon further speculation. The mark of the beast. The number of his name, 666. We get those verses tonight, and as we embark on this little journey, let's ask the Lord to speak to us. Father, we again have come to your house to study your word, and we pray that you would speak to us through the power of it. Lord, we pray that no one would leave this place fearful. The answer is found in you, Lord, for all these things. Your grace indeed is sufficient. Your mercy is unending and everlasting. We pray that you would bless us, Lord, as we study. Speak to us now through the power and the majesty of your infallible word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, as we embark on this journey in the Mark of the Beast, I want to remember that so far, we've kind of seen this political authority. He's going to be 100% of the political power in the world will be tied up in one person. That's going to be the Antichrist. The Antichrist will, in essence, in that sense, be the one world ruler. You'll have the false prophet, another beast that we've seen rise up, one out of the sea of humanity, one from the earth itself. The second beast will rise up and will become the prophet for the first beast and will promote a one world religion will control all the ecclesiastical power in the world. So all of the world's religions will join together and turn really to this one power, also known as the beast, but really as the false prophet, because it will be the second beast that worships the first. And then we find what will happen. And as these two begin to do their deed, as they pour out their power onto the earth, both in a governing sense and in a religious sense, it only makes sense that they're going to need to control the entire world's economy as well. And so we come to this verse that's often fought over, haggled over, speculated upon, and begins in verse 16. We'll look at verses 16 to 18 tonight and the mark of the beast. The Antichrist one day will control every single thing that's bought and sold, according to this passage. Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great. And notice the three categories of distinction here. Both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so it becomes very clear that if you're going to engage in any kind of commerce anywhere in the world, that you will need this mark. And this mark is not described for us in the terms that John would have seen it. He doesn't give us any further detail about that. But as we look at our world, up until really about 40 years ago, the thought of something being able to be used in the entire world to control all the world's commerce was a pipe dream. It simply didn't exist. There was no controlling method whereby people could gather together uh, all of the information that was necessary to control your life. Now, I want you to, to shout out at, at, loud, uh, at loud at once, if you happen to know the answer to this next question, how many numbers are there on a normal credit card or ATM card on the front of the card? 16. Amen? Keep that in mind. Keep that number in mind. That is the universal standard for data when you're collecting data with regard to monetary units. That number is so variable that it could handle up to about 10 billion people. We're only about 7 billion now. So to give you an idea, that numbering system, you don't need any more than 16 numbers 
to give a unique number to every single person on the planet. San Jose Mercury newspaper dated August 8, 1975. Listen to these words by Dr. Henry Alderman. He was the head at the time of the European Common Marketplace Confederacy in Brussels. He said, the massive plan involves a digital numbering system for every human being. Now bear in mind, this is 41 years ago. Every human being on Earth, a computer would assign each citizen a world number that would be invisibly laser tattooed on the forehead or the back of the hand. This guy was not a Christian, by the way. And it would provide a walking credit card system. The number would show up on infrared scanners and be placed in all checkout counters and places of business. By using this three, uh, six digital unit, the entire world can be assigned a working number. An international mark that would do away with all currency or coin instead of credit notes or exchanging through a World Bank fixation system. Nobody could buy or sell without the digital marking system on them. One man would have his finger at the tips of any number on the face of the earth. And when one of the market leaders was asked how this would happen, he responded this way. He said, if anyone objected, what would they do? What would happen to that person if they refused to cooperate? And the doctor replied this way, we would have to use force to make him conform to the new requirements. It won't work unless everybody's in. So 41 years ago, they began to talk about something that I believe comes into view for us very clearly in our passage. The Antichrist is going to bring intense persecution across the globe. We know that the first three and a half years, he's going to be largely a man of peace. The second three and a half years, a man of war. And he'll begin to show his true colors. And part of that showing of those colors is he's going to control everything. It'll appear at first he's after the common good of the world. He'll, he'll then transition into a true dictator, ultimately to a despot. Someone who will absolutely, for whatever reason, do whatever he wants to do with the entire globe. And in that line, contrasts will not matter. And so notice the contrasts here that are mentioned. As you look at verse 16, he causes both or causes all, both the small and the great, the rich, the poor, the free and the slave, to receive the mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And notice this mark is given. They're, they're receiving it. The word that's translated there in the Greek language means that it is not only, not only obligatory, but at the same time it is also volitional. In other words, people will choose to have this mark. You're going to have a choice. There will be something to choose. You can say no. No. But if you say no, you're, you're going to be part of an underground community that will be instantaneously marked for death. So you will have a choice, and you will not be forced to take it. So for those that speculate that you know, somehow you're going to be forced to take the mark of the beast, number one, uh, if you're here tonight and you love the Lord Jesus and you've asked him into your heart, he is your Savior, he's your Lord, you don't need to worry about it. Amen? Because you're not going to be here. So when these things happen, that's why when the Christian community begins to debate over these issues, I kind of ask myself, well, why? Why would we debate over who is or who is not? The fact of the matter is the people on earth at the time will have no choice. So if you believe that God will rapture his church, as I do, then I'm not going to really worry about whether the church is going to be forced because the church isn't going to be here when that happens. He uses every race, creed, color, socioeconomic background. Notice nobody is excluded. And he does a very purposeful job. Small and great. Speaks of their social status. It doesn't matter whether you're great in the kingdom or you're the least of the kingdom. It doesn't matter whether you're at the top of the rung or the bottom of the ladder. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. Of course, their economic class is also not going to matter. So you're not going to be able to be a Donald Trump and buy whatever you want. There will be no such thing. I firmly believe that he's going to control the world's monetary system. He's also going to control the money itself. We have those conditions already in play. We have the World Bank. We have the London Interbank Exchange that 
basically transits all electronic transactions all over the globe every single night at midnight, boom, they're all done, shipped all over the globe. So those systems already exist. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. Because during that time, one of the things I believe the Antichrist will do is he's basically going to confiscate the world's wealth. It's interesting that we look at our world today and we wonder when that's going to occur. And we've seen it happen before. We watch what happened with the rise of communist, uh, the union of Soviet, Soviet socialist republics, the Soviet Union, as they began to share everything. The whole concept of throwing everything into one pot and equally distributing did not work too well, amen? I happened to, to go into the Soviet Socialist Republic right before the fall of the Iron Curtain. And when you, you went into a store, they had some huge stores, but there was 11 things, and those 11 things occupied entire aisles all the way from one end of the store to the other. A whole aisle of nothing but one kind of bread and a whole aisle of nothing but one kind of soup, and a whole aisle of nothing but one kind of paper goods. That's the way it was. And the only people that had it different than that were the uber-wealthy, the oligarchs. Rich and poor, it won't matter. Free and slave. It doesn't matter whether you work for somebody or you don't. It doesn't matter whether you're the boss or whether you're the person that works for that person. Those that are under the bondage of slavery will be able to receive the mark, just as those who would be free in that sense. The mark, the word that's used here <coughs> is, a, is a Greek word. It's quite unique. It's sharagma. And that particular word uh, is, is not easy to discern. It is exactly the same word, except in Hebrew, it was used for the children of Israel when they were to bind the word on their forehead and on their right hand. And so the picture is exactly the same as Deuteronomy 6, uh, if you want to turn there. And we can kind of see it. Beginning in verse 4, and notice what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. This is part of the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and you shall bind them as a sign. The exact same word, except in Hebrew, happens to be shaman, upon your hand. And they shall be on your frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house. And if you've ever seen an Orthodox Hebrew, a Jewish person, especially the Hasids, uh, they, they actually bind the Word of God to their hand. They wrap a leather thong around it seven times, goes up above the elbow, and they will normally be wearing what's called a phylactery, which is a small box on their forehead. That box actually contains the Word of God. And so it appears that the Antichrist, even mimicking, because remember, the tribulation is about bringing salvation to the Jewish people, amen? Even mimicking what the Orthodox Jewish people do today, which is to bind the word of God to their hand and to their forehead, that's exactly where the mark of the beast is going to be. And so this new world order will have a governmental component, a religious component, any financial component that rotates together as a singular whole. God's telling these people that, look, you're going to have to, or we're, we're understanding from God's perspective that this is going to be something you're going to have to choose to do. You know, when Joshua made that declaration to the Hebrew people, he said, you choose this day whom you will serve. Joshua 24, and for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's been the cry from the beginning. You have to make the choice. And even during the tribulation, it will be the same exact choice.
going to speak each of, each of us individually if we were at that time. We'd have to make that decision. We're going to see more on this when we get to the next chapter in chapter 14. The third angel will be released and begin to carry this out, actually. The purpose of this mark is actually told to us in the very next verse, in verse 17. And what does it say there? I believe it points to a cashless society. How many of you have millennials that you have in your house that you know, those 20-somethings? Have you ever asked them to give you a, a, any cash? They carry no cash. They pull out ATM cards or some other form of electric. They do not carry cash. I challenge you. Ask somebody who's 20-something, hey, you got any money on? They'll tell you no, but they'll tell you they got an ATM card. We're already moving that way. We're already moving towards no one carrying cash. I, I made a mistake, actually, <laughs> on a, it's kind of sad, actually. Uh, when I was, Connie and I were traveling to go to Pastor Chuck's memorial service at the Honda Center, you know, normally I carry some money, but I didn't have any money, and I didn't even think about it. You had to pay for parking. And I go up there, and, and I was stunned. I pulled out my ATM card and said, sorry, cash only. I said, what? I couldn't believe it, that there were some place as large as the Honda Center where you could not use electronic transaction of some kind. That will not be the world during these days. A matter of fact, money will be useless. And you realize that everything that we print up to a $10 bill, did you know this? Everything up to a $10 bill it actually costs us more money to print those bills than they're actually worth. Every single one of our coins and all of our bills up to a $10 bill, it costs us about $11 or so to print most of those bills. If you look at the technology in our new money, you see the hologram in there, you, you see the x-ray stripe, all those crazy things that are in it. It costs a bunch of money to produce those things. Now imagine... Because your dollar bill actually is only worth about seven cents or so in reality. Now, now imagine that somebody actually gets a plan. Well, that's kind of silly. Why are we making things that cost $10 that are worth less than that? I got an idea. Let's not print money at all. You just carry around this little chip, and when you go to check out for groceries, you go, Hi, Bob. And your groceries are paid for. People are going to fall for it rather quickly. John's speaking of that very thing, I believe, in this passage, a cashless society. We have this technology uh, today. It exists already in our world. People don't like to think about it, don't like to talk about it. But if you were to look at the real solution, it's just a simple microchip planted underneath your skin. And we're going to look at those very he fairly heavily. May 13, 1997, a, a patent was granted, granted to Applied Digital Solutions. Applied Digital Solutions is the parent co company of VeraChip. Uh, they're the ones. How many of you have dogs that have a chip in them? Or cats? Cats too, yeah. Don't, most of us have dogs and cats that have a chip in there. You know what that chip's for, right? It, it doesn't send out radio waves. It doesn't do any of that. But it can be scanned. So if your dog is picked up by animal control, and they end up in a shelter, they run a scanner over your dog. It has a number, a 16-digit number, by the way. That 16-digit number is assigned to your dog or to your cat, and hence they know whose dog or cat it is so they can get the fine out of you for losing your animal. <laughs> so we already actually have this technology uh, in wide use in our world today. But that digital recovery system is what it was called then. Tracking and recovery system was the reason for, for putting those chips together. December 10, 1999, just a couple of years later, uh, they actually acquired a patent and technology producing a, a transceiver called the Digital Angel. Uh, that is actually now still produced by VeraChip. And I want to make sure that you understand this. This chip that we currently have is a passive chip. It is not powered. Anybody that tells you it is is not being truthful. They're buying into all the internet garbage that's floating out there. There's no electromagnetic motor that's powered by your skin. There's none of those things yet. They are working on that technology. It's just simply a digital number. And so you have to have a scanner. It works from about 10 to 18 inches from your skin. So where it is good 
is like walking through scanners when you go out of a store or waving your hand over uh, the exact same thing that you do. You know how no, you, anybody remember when we used to actually have people who actually used a cash register to ring up your groceries? They'd be looking at the thing and going like this, and you know now it's it's the same thing. They'll just have a reader there, and you can use your hand or you can you know wave your head over it. <laughs> you see. It can't be used to track you by GPS or any of those applications yet. That simply is false. It's not true. Make sure that you don't pass those things along because it makes you look like a fool when somebody actually checks it out. So when everybody's, oh, they're going to track me wherever I go, they cannot do that. They can mark you in a specific place if they happen to have scanners in place. But that's the only way that they can be tracked up to this point in time. There's simply an identification. What is this? It's simply an identification. It's a way to know that you are you. It's a mark that says you have applied for this particular process, and boom, there you are. There's your number. When it's implanted in your body, you've got to scan it. It's that simple. There it is. It's a digital angel chip. That's actually what it's known as. They're used all over the place. As you look at that little chip, it's about a little bit larger. It's like twice the size of a piece of long grain rice. It's injected with a cannula, that little thing in the middle. It's basically like a giant syringe. Uh, the chip goes inside of it. It's got a plunger. They stick that. That's a pretty good sized needle. I don't think I want that in my hand. Or my forehead. Imagine that in your forehead. <laughs> it's like you have like this little horn thing. It's kind of appropriate, actually, now that I think about it. But yeah, it's... It's real. It's a radio frequency ID chip. It's what it does. It basically has a number in it. It's perfect for buying and selling. It cannot monitor patients. It cannot monitor vital signs. It cannot be used to track cattle. It cannot be used for any of those things. That's just pure silliness. They're working on that. Now, they could make a chip that would do that. But the technology that we have today would not allow for that. Where it can be used and is being used, and you may have seen it, they're chipping firearms. And those firearms actually are within that 10 to 18 inches, and so that that number actually unlocks a locking device on the firearm. So if you don't have the corresponding chip, uh, you can't use that weapon. Interesting little tidbit there. Can you say Big Brother is watching you? How many of you have read George Orwell's 1984? you remember that? Big Brother's watching you. Maybe some of you saw that commercial. It was like six or eight years ago, something like that. There was that commercial where the guy, you know, grabbed, all, it looked like he was shoplifting, and he grabbed all the stuff and stuck it in his jacket, and he's running out the door of the store. And it looks like he's stealing stuff, and the security guard goes running after him and said, Hey, mister, you forgot your receipt. It was actually on this technology because he'd actually checked out by just simply walking out of the store. Picked up his number, then charged everything because they had a little RFID tag on everything that he picked up, so naturally they can work together. It's able to trigger that type of monetary exchange. As these chips were developed, one of the things that's interesting about them, the chief scientist, Dr. Peter Zhu, the, of, uh, of Applied Digital Solutions who developed them, is actually claims to be a Christian. And so he said, look, you can't use these for that type of, uh, of, a, of a situation. And of course, he's absolutely incorrect because that is pretty much the only thing that they're good for. They've got a number in them, a 16-digit number to be exact. And so as he began to talk about these things, he said, oh, they'll never be used in human beings. That was the man who invented them. They will never be used in human beings. That was in the year 2000, 2006. Canada. Verichip makes the first human implantable RFID chips for Canadian newborn babies in Brampton, Ontario, Canada, their new hospital they just built. And they did them, so they put up scanners at the door, so they chip your child. That way, no one can get out the door with your child. It sets off an alarm. So they are using them. The Canadian military and two branches of the Canadian military is already experimenting with this exact chip for that reason. So you walk through something, say you're going into your barracks, guess what? 
Your chip triggers the sensor inside of the barracks. It tells everybody you're in. It logs you in. It will also log you out. It can even lock doors. Matter of fact, when these things were first invented, uh, the scientists that developed the technology, uh, it, interestingly enough, Dr. Kevin Warwick, uh, director of cybernetics at Reading University in, in England, uh, actually put one in himself and then programmed a bunch of monitors and sensors throughout the lab to open and close doors, to do all kinds of stuff. So they are quite capable of doing things in close proximity. So if you want to buy and sell stuff, and you want to control who gets what, so you do this. You know, now when you put your card in and it says, your card has no money, you know, we hate that thing. Your card's dead, it's empty, it looks at you and it has like a smiley face with a circle and a slash kind of thing. It's like, you have no cash in SF, not sufficient funds. Now imagine that's your hand. They've got you right there. Oh, here comes Mr. Friendly, and he, you know, puts you in the back of the car and takes you off. Dr. Warwick said that by linking these things up to other sensors, you could conceivably control the global commerce. So he actually knew that ultimately this type of technology could be used. Emory University in Atlanta, here in our own country, began to look at uh, using these particular chips as a basis for controlling other things. And so one of the things that they did, they began to uh, implant them uh, into little robotic organisms and have them kind of communicate. So when Unit 1 got next to Unit 2, Unit 2 did its thing and Unit 3 did its thing and they actually could cooperate that way. So the technology is there to do exactly uh, what we are fearing will come one day. Brandeis University has actually experimented in, in the area of uh, artificial intelligence by linking together the common triggers that these things represent. And so very, very, very powerful technology uh, exists in our world today that I believe is right around the corner. The reality is We've spent a lot of time, a lot of money, a ton of intelligence developing these things. The technology is amazing. It actually has wonderful potential. You know, they're supposedly going to remove these chips out of the children once they're out of the hospital. They're there for a period of time. That uh, leaves a very, very small mark on their hand, uh, which is where they're currently putting them in the web of the hand. But the bottom line is very probable that the Antichrist could use this type of technology to control the world's economic uh, systems as we know them. Now imagine that you no longer have credit cards, you don't need them. How many of you have chipped credit cards now? The ones that you have to put in the bottom? Yeah, that is, that is exactly the same technology except it's flat. And so goes inside the bottom, identifies you as you. What it does is picks up that number. That number is stored in a computer someplace. That information is now available. It says, yeah, this is what your credit rating is. This is it's got all that ability. And so when you plug that thing in, you're plugging into the very system uh, that the Antichrist will likely one day use to accomplish this task. Now notice what the number of his name is. Verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, if you Google search the Internet for 666, you're going to get some absolutely crazed, whacked out things that after you look at them for a while, your brain will be ready to explode. Probably many of you can remember when Mikhail Gorbachev, it was believed that you could actually see Satan in the birthmark on his forehead, and so he was the Antichrist. I mean, it, it's just, it's nuts. And, and you look at what is being said. Here's the wisdom. Let him, it's the number of a man. And so we know exactly what this is. It's the number of a man. It's a number of a certain specific person. And yet we've written volumes and volumes of books with speculation about, you know, who the Antichrist is. It's been like every pope, 
Uh, it was John F. Kennedy, Henry Kissinger. You know that Ronald Wilson Reagan, his, the numerical value of the first letters of his name is 666. It's like people were, oh, it's, it's, it's Reagan. People have said it's President Obama. It, it's like Nero, Caligula, Elvis. I mean, even Elvis got it for a while. Hitler, Stalin, Hillary Clinton, possible. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. I didn't mean to say that. just came out. <laughs> Could really be Donald Trump, actually. <laughs> Equal opportunity here. <laughs> the Beatles were actually supposed to be collectively the Antichrist. I mean, it's just it's insane what people have come up with. And they, they haggle over it. You know, you got people... That, there's a couple of books, honestly, that are like four and five hundred pages of how people came to the conclusion that it's person A versus person B. But I want you to notice something. The list, I believe, will continue to grow. People will keep throwing names out there and people are going to keep speculating until uh, the church is taken home. And I do believe that people spend way too much time uh, trying to figure this whole thing out. It, it's, and so he simply says, here is wisdom. Everybody knows what wisdom is, right? In, in a very simple definition, it is the capacity or the ability to use knowledge correctly. In other words, wisdom, knowledge is, is the basic facts. It's the things that you could understand and know. But you can have the basic facts and use them incorrectly. Wisdom uses knowledge correctly. And so it says, here's wisdom. And he goes on to say, look, this is the number of a man. Frankly, I don't actually care all that much who the Antichrist is going to be in, in that sense. And I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. Because I don't believe I'm going to be here when he's around. So for me, I, I want to know more about Jesus and not as much about 666. Just, just saying. So, you know, people come and, well, who do you think is going to... Well, I hate to tell you this, I don't care. What? You don't care who's going to be the anti? No, I really don't care. I know he's going to come. I know who he's going to be. He's going to be a man. You see, people get carried away and, and they start running down Hebrew and Greek and where they end up is places like this. <laughs> this is no joke. People actually believe that the president of Monster Energy Drink may be the Antichrist because if you look at the sign... It, it looks like three of the Hebrew Vav, which looks exactly like those little squiggles on there. That happens to be the number six. So if you drink monster energy drinks, you're worshiping the Antichrist, okay? Just so you know that. So tell your kids, don't let them get anywhere near monster energy drinks. And they're, notice what they named the next batch, Demon. So, you know, maybe it's true. I, you know, I don't know. And it says on there, if you can't see it, on the bottom of it, it says, Unleash the Beast. So they've kind of run with this whole thing. And they're selling, so they're selling this stuff on the premise that there are knucklehead, silly, foolish Christians out there. Well, you know, that's the Antichrist drink, so it sells more monster. Serious mental issues. Look, numbers play a tremendous uh, role in the Bible. We've already seen the 144,000. That's 12 times 12. 12 is the number of completion. It's used to signify the, the totality of God's plan being carried out. So in human government, in human institutions, when you talk about 12 of anything, 12 is it's done. So the number 12, we know that. 13 is consequently the number of Satan. Throughout Scripture, the number that's associated with him is the number 13. And so when, when you see him, he, he's normally 13. Eight speaks of new beginnings, so it's seven plus one. Seven being the number of completion. So there is, uh, in a sense, that we can look at, at that. And the number six speaks for man, which man is incomplete. Remember, we were made in God's image, but we're not completely God. Amen? 
We're, we're man. We're incomplete in that sense. We have this wonderful capacity because of grace to come to know God and to receive salvation. And one day we're going to be you know, glorified when we get to heaven, but right now we're incomplete. And so I believe you know, quite simply that the number six and three of them speaks of the totality of incomplete man. And so this is probably going to be the greatest man that's ever walked the face of the earth. People are going to look at him and they're going to attribute incomplete man times whoa, whoa, whoa. Every time we see three, that's God making an exclamation point. So in this case, six, 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 I believe is nothing more than God saying this is going to be the fullness of what mankind can absolutely do. If there was ever, if you were to look at this man and say, greatest man that's ever walked the face of the earth, the Antichrist is going to be him. So he's going to be powerful. My guess is he's going to be look, good looking. He's going, to, he's going to have all kinds of people following after him. He'll have an entourage like you can't believe. But people keep guessing. They keep wondering. They, they keep speculating. And just, you know, to make this fun, because by now you could use a little humor, um, I happen to know that in fact, and this is how it works. Okay, I want you to watch this. The gematria is a, is a study of numbers as they relate to letters. So Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, both use a numbering system to follow their letters. Greek, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, that's one, two, three, four, right? So watch this. So if you take Barney, good old, he is a cute purple dinosaur, right? You change all the U's to V's, because that's Latin, because Latin is the language from which the Bible was translated into English. Sounds right, yeah? You extract all the Roman numerals. We give credence to good old St. Augustine who made Christianity the world's religion. That gives you C, V, V, L, D, I, and V. Convert those to their Arabic values, which is 100, 5, 5, 50, 500, 1, and 5. And that's right, it totals 666. <laughs> Barney is the Antichrist. I knew it. I knew it. That guy has creeped me out since the first time I saw him. And yet, little kids flock to him. He's a multi-billionaire. It's him. Now, see, that's exactly what happens. And I'm showing you that because that's pretty much how people come to these conclusions. They take some kind of speculation and say, well, you know, I think this equals that and this equals this. And so we'll extract all these things and this will leave this. And it'll always make 666. So don't get caught up in it. What does he really say? He says, here's wisdom. God's key is use wisdom. We're not to concern ourselves. Remember Hebrews 12, 2? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen? For the glory set before him despised not the, the shame of the cross, but, but went to that cross, despised that shame, and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. That's where Jesus is. That's what we care about. We care about where the Lord Jesus is tonight. That's the wisdom. You see, you and I are going to know this, this man we, if we were here to see it uh, by his fruit. That'll be clear. He'll be the most perfect man that ever existed. He will be 666. But I think the Apostle Paul gave us some insight in 2 Thessalonians 2 there in verse 7. And it says, Therefore the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. In other words, the spirit of the Antichrist the spirit is already here. And so when we look at the digital angel bear a chip thing and the mark of the beast, the spirit to use that's already here. The spirit to draw all world religions together into one homogenous mess that is governed by a single prophet is already here. The world is crying out for global solutions. I mean, our country is in absolute turmoil right now. You listen to people talk about the election cycle we're in, and it's like, you know, I expect everybody to run around, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. You know, I, it's like Chicken Little all over again. As believers, we either trust God or we don't. Amen? Well, we're trusting God. We need to do our civic duty. We absolutely must vote. We have to exercise our right as God-fearing Christians to go to the ballot box and cast our votes for those who are as close to Christian values as we possibly can, to represent as best we can the things of the Lord. But look, our hope is not our government, amen? But the system is in place for people to hope in a world government. It's where the world is going. The spirit of the Antichrist, Paul said, 
And he says it, only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Now imagine, because in each one of us, the Holy Spirit resides. Amen? Isn't that the seal of God's work of salvation? We now have the work of the Holy Spirit by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit actually in each one of us. So now imagine that every single Christian is no longer on the earth. The work of the Holy Spirit is going to be few and far between. Amen? Because it's not going to be working out of you as you know what God's Word says and you begin to do that and you preach that. Your life replicates it wherever you go. You, you see, the Holy Spirit is going to be absent from that time in that sense. Right now, the Holy Spirit resides. Let's, let's give you know, the, the large number. Let's say there's 1.6 billion Christians in the world. Each one of us indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Each one of us prayerfully making an impact in our world for the cause of Christ, for the gospel message. Now imagine that in, influence is out. It's going to be very easy for people to turn to a one-world government and to a one-world religion and certainly to a one-world monetary system. Matter of fact, it will be unbelievably attractive. It's already attractive. You know, I sit there and I look at, you know, it, it's crazy. How many of you now do your taxes yourself and you do it online? All right, not so many. I do. Have for years, more than a decade. I sit there and go through, and it's crazy. The IRS has my tax return in like 40 seconds. So if you do them by hand, you remember, you, you mail it off in an envelope, and then, you know, six weeks later... They write you and they say, you made a mistake on line three. <laughs> you remember those days? And now it's like you type it in. There's automatic error check. It's like you get your, and, and your refund is deposited or worse yet, <coughs> your debit <laughs> comes right out of your checking account. It's so simple. If you're not doing it, you might want to give it a try. But the world is ripe for that kind, of, that kind of life. I can't even tell you how much time it saves. I'm sitting there, it's like, last year I think I did like 100 pages of tax, tax forms. It auto-populates, you know, you're typing away, okay, well that number needs to go on that page, and on that page, and on that page, and on that page. Now imagine that you could have a little chip in the back of your hand, and boop, my taxes are done. Yeah. <laughs> Just went to Costco. 200 bucks. <laughs> people be pretty up to that, don't you think? I mean, most people are kind of like, it sounds simple to me. I mean, why do I want to? Any of you men ever get back aches from sitting on your wallet if you drive more than 40 minutes? <laughs> I hate sitting on my wallet. I've tried taking it. I now take it out and put it on the console because I can't stand sitting on it. Now imagine you don't need one. Because when you scan this thing, it brings up your driver's license, it brings up your FICO score, it brings up your bank accounts, it brings up everything. Does your taxes for you, dials up the Antichrist. <laughs> Not going to tell you that part. But that's part of the plan. So the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Spirit working in every believer. And I believe exactly what 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says. It's not appointed us unto wrath, but unto salvation. Amen? So we're going to be gone. Me, I'm looking unto Jesus. The author, the finisher of my faith. There's a coming day when unless you've been marked by God, you see, you all have been marked by God, amen? Amen. amen? amen. Ah, he wrote you down in his book. It's the same word, by the way. He wrote you down in his book, Lamb's Book of Life. You don't have to worry about it. You're not going to get blotted out of that bad boy. You're going to heaven one day. That's a promise from the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. You get pretty excited. You don't have to worry about receiving the mark of the beast. But you do need to warn other people who might be here when that happens. That's important. 
because there are a lot of people that don't know the Lord. We have an obligation while we're here to make sure that we have preached his name. Preach Christ crucified until he comes, as scripture says. I want to leave you with the words of the Apostle Paul from Romans chapter 13 tonight, verse 11 to 14. It says, and do this knowing the time. It's now high time to wake out of that sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Amen. Isn't that an awesome promise? Your ultimate salvation, you see, your salvation began when you said the sinner's prayer, and your salvation experience ends when you go home to be with the Lord. So your fullness is another way to look at this, of your salvation is nearer than when you first believed. You first believed, you gave your life to Jesus, and you've been a believer, but the culmination is your exaltation with Jesus when you get there, because one day we know we're going to be like he is. Amen? Doesn't mean you're going to be God. Just means you're going to be no more sinful you. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Amen. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. The day what? The day of the Lord. The day when Christ comes. The day when the trumpet sounds. And therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, those things which are still in our lives, which are not pleasing to the Lord. Get rid of them. Take out the trash, amen? Put that stuff in a dumpster where it belongs. And let us put on the armor of light. Can you imagine what it would look like if we were actually clothed in the light of the Lord? Just fully clothed in the light of the Lord. To where wherever we went, we were like he is. It's what we're supposed to be doing. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and darkness, which is lewdness and lust, not in strife and in envy. And he goes on to give us that secret, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh or to fulfill its lusts. Now that's, that's what we ought to be focusing on, not whether Barney is the Antichrist or not. Not whether you can figure out who the number of the man, which is going to be the Antichrist, who, who that actually is. We may know, we may not know. My guess is, I, I don't believe we're going to know. I think that's all going to happen before the Lord takes us out of here. We might. Maybe we'll see the beginning stages of it. But we know this. There's going to be seven years uh, of tribulation. We're not going to be here for it. Get right with the Lord Jesus. Let him mark your life. That's the answer, amen? Then you don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. I'm not worried. Nobody's going to come stick a needle in my forehead tonight. They, they decide they want to do that. That's, you know, going to be one of those things I'm going to have to refuse. Maybe the world's longest fast before I go home to see Jesus. But I'm not worried because I know my Redeemer lives and my Bible says one day I'll see him face to face on this earth. Amen? Why don't you stand and let's pray together. Precious Lord Jesus, how we long to see you Lord, how we can't wait for that trumpet sound. Lord, may we be found gazing into the heavens. Lord, not because we're unbusy, Lord, but because we've been so busy about our Father's business that we are living our lives expectantly of your return. Lord, we thank you for the promise of the rapture of the church. Lord, we know that one day uh, you are going to snatch us home. And Lord, then these things will begin to unfold in fullness. And until that time, may we bear the truth in this world. Would that Holy Spirit work that has worked in us also work out of us to convince and convict. Lord, to preach the gospel with our existence. Lord, may we be about, about our Father's business in these last days. Thank you for the steadfastness and strength that we can have because we're your kids. Lord, we want to walk in the light we don't want to dabble in the darkness and so lord we pray that you would strengthen us and bless us and fill us and anoint us 
Uh, make us your mouthpiece, Lord. Would we speak forth uh, the truth that Jesus loves us? How would that be visible to men? We love you. We praise you. We thank you. And God's people all said, Amen. Amen, amen. Let's worship.